they've sinned. That's too old to wee yourself at school. I'm kind of that related to Tony Blair. <laughs> there wasn't anything, hello! <laughs> Hello, you join me on the floor in the midst of a life crisis. Not a big life crisis, but lockdown is magnifying small things for me. Generally in a really great mood, but my world has shrunk. I feel like a retired old person who has a fixation on the bins. This is me this morning. Don't I look lovely? Aren't I doing a great job of my makeup? Isn't the focus on point? Don't I look like I think I'm going somewhere in life? Well, I spent all morning on that video and the audio fucked. And I don't mean like just a gentle little hiccup. I mean like, she's gone. RIP the audio. <laughs> I'm a confident person, but you know, I did go to some places of like, you don't deserve, deserve your life. life. Why don't, Why you, don't understand you understand technology? technology? Who do you Who think, think you are? are? Trying to command, command a mic's, a mic's freedom. freedom. And the insult to injury was that that video was a rush video in replacement for a video I have not yet completed that was supposed to go up on Friday. But through a combination of lockdown brave and overcommitment to other things and general mismanagement, that one's not ready either. So. It's fine, I've had a cup of tea, and I decided instead, I've thrown out the chair, the makeup has still survived, but I'm about to obliterate it, and we're gonna do a deconstruction and talk about failure. Good. Good. I turned 30 in May. Yeah, we get it, Lily, we talk about every fucking video. And I almost had a meltdown about it, but then I didn't. Age is a construct, and 30 is the biggest construct con of all. But there are a lot of things I feel like we feel under pressure to do before the age of 30. It seems like our generation are allowed to join the wild thorn breeze, explore a bit more, not expected to have their shit together straight away. But 30 feels like a pretty solid deadline at which you should probably understand, I don't know, how to get a pension and how to work a mic. So this video is gonna be me taking off my perfect makeup, <laughs> remaking myself up, physically and emotionally, and talking to you about all the things I didn't do before I was 30. And yet here I am, slathering oil onto my face in front of strangers as a job. Those of you who watch my Christmas gift guide might recognize this mandarin cleansing oil from Naloa. I've made some progress on it. <laughs> I'm gonna need to order some more. It's a great independent um, skincare brand and they're organic, vegan, cruelty-free, and black owned, um, so, I'm not gonna mention loads of products in this video, but credit where credit's due, this is, you're about to see how powerful this stuff is. I don't mean to alarm anybody, don't worry, it's all under control. This is just how I melt my makeup off. Failure is a part of life. Apart from, as I mentioned in other videos, I hate the school system, which isn't the school system's fault as well, it's born out of a societal attitude, that failures pile up. If you fail year three, it's gonna impact your performance in year four, which it did for me. I uh, wet myself in year four in front of quite a few boys. <laughs> I was too old to wet myself. How old was I? Seven, eight? That's too old to wee yourself at school. Anyway. I feel like even though failure is a frequent and it's like as normal as weeing yourself, really. It's a frequent thing that humans do. We often, tally up our failures in our head and use it to make a hypothesis about what kind of person we are in a way that we don't do with our successes or at least the things, not even success, just things we manage not to do. Like I've driven a car several times and I haven't killed anyone yet. Who's totting that up? <laughs> what about all the relatives you are still in contact with and have great relationships with? rather than the one that you don't talk to at all. That doesn't make you a fail. Like, you have a failed relationship in your 20s. Ratio-wise, you're probably not that far into the amount of relationships you're gonna have in your life. So to fuck up what is potentially one of eight isn't that bad, it's just you don't have all the data yet. <sighs> oh my God, I feel better already. Why buy self-help books when you can just wash your face and have a cup of tea. Oh, what's it, what's it called? This is a poem that I love that I think I read out for you at one point and the last lines are, put down the gun and have a sandwich. And I feel like that's been a lot of it, people's experiences, especially this year. It's like everything feels bigger than it is, you know? I do still have like glitter freckles from my eye makeup, but I'm okay with that. Imagine if you could have glitter freckles. It'd be like being the rainbow fish in real life. So the first thing I didn't do before I was 30 was get a mortgage. Where I'm from, I'd say the majority of people from my school 
stayed in that town. Now there's, nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong like living where you're from if it suits you and if you like it and if it works with the kind of life you envision. But for me it just didn't. <laughs> I, want, I was one of the kids that just wanted to get out and like listen to all the songs that were like, you know, the kind of Dick Whittington pop tunes that are just like, get me out of this town, man, I wanna see the world. And I didn't go that far, to be fair. I went to London, Dick Whittington did up, but I knew on some level that there was a choice there. And the choice was adequately get compensated for the work that you do to the point where you can support yourself, afford property and get nice things and have a car and stuff. Or for me, the choice was being in, be, be in an industry that really excited me, widen the horizons of people I could meet and like be rich in experiences, you know? Not that you can't have that in other places, but for me and the career I wanted to get into, that was the choice. Now I'm not mad about the fact that I made that choice. And I indeed, I spent eight years in London. I left and I'm now actually back in the Midlands. For how long? Who can say? London is an incredibly expensive city. The prices are literally ast astronomical. Um, and I knew from the beginning that it would, be, it would be near impossible for me to buy a house there. So I haven't. I'm 30 and I do not own any property. I'm still renting. In fact, my last video was all about renting. Plug. <laughs> now, am I a failure have, for having not had a house? No, it is one of those celebrated milestones um, that people congratulate you on and you can talk about and it is very exciting to own a house. Would I like to own a house at some point? Totally, yes. One could say I'm actually getting kind of broody for it. But do I think it astronomically affected the quality of my 20s? No. <laughs> yes, have there been occasional issues with the landlords? <laughs> you have no idea. In fact, <laughs> Here are three things on the screen that my last lord, landlord wanted to charge us for when we moved out. Fingerprints on the light switches, otherwise known as evidence of human inhabitants. Anyway, <laughs> but the point I want to impress on you is if you realise there are things you want to do with your life, or places you want to live in your 20s, and that might compromise the idea of you being a homeowner. I don't think you risk inherent unhappiness. In fact, there's a really comforting um, Wheezy Waiter video where he calculates, now that he's a homeowner, if he thinks in the long term he has saved money by owning a house. And he concludes that he's kind of like gonna come out about the same, maybe about $50 up. <laughs> Because of the cost of like maintaining a house and if you get a mortgage in your 20s, the, the small down payment you're likely to be able to put down and therefore the amount of interest you will accumulate on top of the cost of the house, he reckons he's in about the same. And that's obviously not gonna be the case for everybody. But I think looking around at people that have houses, um, who are your friends or in your peer groups or all that kind of thing, one, people aren't often open if you don't know them well and fair enough about their own financial privileges like things that their parents have lent them or helped them with um so while i don't think it's you don't have to disclose that it's also worth noting that you don't know everything about somebody's bank balance and you don't know if you're better off long term owning a house um in a specific area that you're in at least in those first 10 years it might actually be better just to save your money and see where the wind takes you. Something that I'm really scared of is buying a house that I don't want and then nobody else <laughs> will buy it from me and I'll be stuck. So while there are lots of like annoying things about renting, it is also a little bit safer when you're in your 20s and you don't know who you're gonna be with in your 30s and who you're who your partner's gonna be. That's been something a lot of people I know have had trouble with. And you don't know what location you're gonna be in. So unless you know the kind of house you want to live in and maybe the people you want to own it with and where you want that house to be, forgive yourself for not achieving that. You, you're not on a, you know, the deadline isn't 30 for that. Calm down. The next one is have kids. I could make a whole video on this, um, but for me, kids is not a priority and I, I don't feel strongly about having kids, but what I do feel, do feel strongly about, and like I feel like it's a conviction that not everybody has and I wish that they did, is that children should be wanted and not just tolerated or, oh, I think I'd be an okay parent, I'll do that. Oh, I'm a nice person, it'll be fine. Like genuinely wanted. There is a massive rain cloud about to break behind my window. <laughs> and if that isn't prophetic fallacy, I don't know what is. Pathetic, prophetic. It seems to be pathetic, but obviously, linguistically, it should be prophetic. Whatever. I'm just resigning myself to the fact that this makeup is going to be a lot shitter than the last one. So here's another clip of the last makeup I did, just so I have something better to look at than this. While, I, you know, 
the urge to have children and the real desire to procreate is something that can come at you at any point. I don't think it's productive to imply um, that people are going to change their minds about it or that it's inevitable that people will change their minds. It kind of, it's kind of like you wouldn't go to a marriage you know, something that somebody's intentionally done and is happy and visibly happy in a lifestyle they're visibly happy committing to and, and are content in and say, well, this won't last, like, inevitably. <laughs> I reject the idea that you can approach, you know, either single people or people in relationships and not wanting to have children, like actively child-free people, and imply that they're going to change their minds because you know them better than them. <laughs> not a good look much like this look so yeah there are lots of reasons why i don't think children would work for me i don't think i'm the best person to raise children and also i have all these other things that i really want to do and while i could probably do both i don't really want to intentionally put myself under an astronomical amount of strain i always like second guess myself to talk about this because i just don't want to offend anybody whilst also vehemently defending the side that is literally never defended when it comes to the debates about children. I just want to release you from that feeling that if they're not something that you actively are really excited um, to have, like don't don't be waiting around for yourself to get excited about it, just go, you do you. It sounds, and believe me, I've read more books on childbirth and child rearing than is normal, but it seems like a really magical experience. But to say it's the transcendent, overall best human experience you can have kind of dulls down all the other amazing human experiences you can have as well no so just because you haven't had children by the age of 30 i'm not judging you and soon the rest of the world won't either we're just giving it some time to catch up but like don't worry about it <laughs> random one is go to disneyland <laughs> i've been to disneyland paris when i was about seven and even at the time i remember thinking this is fine. But for some reason I put that on the list. I don't know what my head was doing at the time, but I feel like people make out these big, these big, you know, arguably quite expensive trips to these like landmark places. It can feel very overwhelming to have these bucket lists on your head of like places that people have been and what they've see, seen, 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 what they've seen. I'm okay. I don't, if somebody wanted to pay to take me to Disneyland, Florida, I'd go. I'd buy an ice cream, I'd go on some of the rides, but I don't, just because it's like a life-changing experience for somebody else, it doesn't, like, I can't express to you how little I care about going to Disneyland, <laughs> like. And I think it's like worth inspecting your own like authentic wants versus an experience you can tell people about and take pictures at and like will go down in history as an amazing experience. Personally, one of my favorite travel experiences was traveling to Salzburg on my own. Wasn't that cool? No. Did people really know the kind of things that I was showing them when I was showing the pictures on my holiday? No, they didn't recognize them. It's worth, I think, in your 20s, assessing your bucket list and making sure the things that you want to do are genuinely the things that would are meaningful experiences to you. Were you not allowed to bring a camera or your friends, would it still be a thing that you want to do? If not, <laughs> consider just spending time with your friends and don't worry about where you are and go and do something that you genuinely want to do. They can be two separate events. Oh my God, this rain cloud is really dark. Can you see that in the thing? Especially when we're trying to like, maybe take less flights than we would have ideally. I would highly suggest only taking flights where you're going somewhere where you know it's gonna be a really meaningful experience for you and you're gonna come back and do better for the world with what you've learned. Or just, you know, if Disneyland really makes you happy and it affects your mental health positively, go for it, come back, make sure you make the most of it and rejuvenate and rest and make sure it's giving you energy to return to your life and inspiration, you know, you know what I mean. I'm not tra trying to travel shame anybody here, I'm just trying to make sure you don't go on trips that you regret, which is what I've done a lot in my 20s to be honest, I've gone on some trips that I regret, def definitely. I would 100% wish I could give back the fuel from those airplanes that took me to those places that I just didn't want to be. Let's see if I can get a light. Oh, fuck you. It's um, <laughs> 30 minutes later. Um, I honestly find it obnoxious when YouTubers talk about uh, tech issues. Just suffice to say, I think I've angered the electronics gods at some point down this road. <laughs> and if I could only pinpoint my sin, I would rectify it. Or perhaps just sacrifice a makeup brush on the top of a hill to whichever god I need to. <laughs> Scatter the blood throughout the land. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> anyway. <coughs> 
composure. The next one was ace my education. That is not a thing I did. I did okay. I behaved, but mainly I was a oh almost there but not kind of like kind of student like. I just went to a normal, I mean, everybody's normal as their own normal, but I just went to a comp, like a comprehensive secondary school in inner city Coventry. And um, I went to Aberystwyth, which is an amazing university. And there's a video up here telling you why it's amazing, but it's not the best. Like when I went, it wasn't the best on paper. Like when people were like, oh, we're going to Aberystwyth University, people were like, oh, and I had like, three times as many UCAS points as I needed to to get in. I just went because I didn't really care about education and I wanted to live near the sea. Anyway, there's a bigger story than that, but it's up there. And I and I got like a two one on my degree, which again is good, but pretty average. Like a lot of people get two ones. I didn't get a first as a lot of people seem to assume for some reason, I don't, which I think again is a perpetual myth that you like, especially in like publishing, that you have to be an amazing academic to get into publishing. And in my masters, or oh, my masters, I just passed. Like I, and you know, a low, a low. We got, we um, cleared the bar, let's say. But I definitely grazed some knees clearing that final fence. I didn't actually go to my graduation. I just got them to post it to me because I was so done with my masters by the time it was over that I was like. Just whack it in the post, mate, say la vie. So I think again, like it's so, it's so important that when you're in education to learn as much as possible, learn how to learn, retain the useful information and also make sure your brain is becoming elastic enough to absorb that information. But if you didn't get that final grade for whatever reason, I don't know, a pandemic, insert personal reasons or circumstances here. As somebody who has, has interviewed many people for many jobs as the interviewer. I do see your grades on the CV, but what is more important to me is that you understand what that grade is and it looks from behind your eyes, you look like you took it in and you're excited to be living. <laughs> There's so many people that I like interviewed who had like these amazing grades from, you know, Oxbridge, but like there wasn't anything, hello. <laughs> And, and that's what's as important, as important, if not more important, is that you know what you learn and you know how to apply it and you're excited to keep learning. Because <laughs> I met some interns who really thought that they've done their learning and they don't need to know anything else now. <laughs> so education is incredibly important, but grades and education are very different things. And anybody who's worth working for understands that. Unless you're somebody who's gonna operate on my brain, in which case I would like you to have the best grades possible, please. <laughs> I realize that I did humanities and this doesn't apply to all fields. But for me, and for perhaps many of you, I think we've inserted a grade system into something that can't necessarily be accurate, accurately graded. And also it's mad to me that my GCSEs used to be like the biggest part of my life <laughs> when I was like 14, 15, 16. And now I genuinely struggle to even remember what my grades were. Like it doesn't, once you get to the next level, like your A-levels, then once you're on them, your GCSEs don't really seem to count. And then once you get into uni, nobody really cares, cares about what A-levels you got. And it just keeps paling into insignificance. So hanging your um, ego off those grades can be incredibly turbulent because people keep disregarding them as you get older. So making sure you've got the grades to get to the next level is important, but obsessing over exactly what the number is rather than what you've learned and retained and if you've actually got better at your discipline not worth it would not recommend do not pass go do not collect 200 labor points to trade in for survival materials or something <laughs> One is definitely bigger than the other. Sisters, not twins. Sisters, not twins. Distant cousins, fourth cousins, wife removed. Mm. Does anybody else have that? I have people messaging me on Heritage DNA being like, we're related. And then I realise we're related by like eight cousins, 10 times removed. And they're usually from the US and I don't know if they just want like a British cousin, but I'm just, <laughs> I usually like either don't message back or I message back being like, yeah, we're not related. Like not, I don't count that. I'm kind of that related to Tony Blair. <laughs> we're all, we're all related. Anyway. <laughs> the next thing I failed at, getting thin. I've already made videos about weight and stuff on this channel, so I'll link those above. The most recent one being putting on weight in quarantine. As somebody who is just has a body, and then also additionally somebody with PCOS, where it's incredibly hard to lose weight and clinically very easy to gain it. Like it's actually hilarious that I have 
different size jeans depending on what kind of week I've had. I just really, uh, for a lot of my early 20s and late teens, I really just thought by 30 I'd be really thin and therefore really happy. <laughs> Which is funny to say now, but it was genuinely one of my beliefs and, and populates a lot of my diary entries. There's not really much to say about that that hasn't already been said by way like better qualified people in um, the body neutrality and body positivity movement. But like, if you have like an age number attached to like what weight you'd like to be, oh man. Think about all the cool shit you could be doing when you were thinking about that. I mean, I'm talking to myself as well because I'm definitely not over it, but like, my name's Lena, I'm 30, I'm very happy, and I am currently at double the weight I thought I would be in my diaries um, <laughs> when I was like 21. You can't put a number on happiness. God, I'm just like Gordon Lovett, whatever his name is, who writes Hallmark cards. But I think if you're gonna set goals for yourself, they can be like, as I spoke about in my New Year's resolutions video, they don't have to be like measurable. They can just be better. So like setting New Year's resolutions where you're like, I want to have a better relationship with food and exercise. And then just be like, yes, I did or no, I didn't every year. Rather than being like, by 30, I'm gonna look like this and it's gonna be incredible. I'm gonna have the ultimate revenge body. I feel like being 30 is explaining yourself to your 20 year old self and being like, you know those metrics you put in place for success? Those were thoroughly under-researched. I'm sorry, mate. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board. So I think it's also just like, you know, reckoning with your younger self and forgiving them for being so wrong about what would make you happy and what's achievable and what's just not worth the focus. By the way, thank you to the Patreon, um, somebody from the Gumption Club who recommended me this essence of nature zeno um eyeliner i'm really enjoying it i was hoping to find a completely plastic free eyeliner but this is as close as you can get i guess for a liquid eyeliner it's um got a little plastic insert and um bamboo on the outside so the it was kind of expensive but to replace the the bit in the middle is like a tenner so i'm hoping i can just use this for the rest of time and never have to buy like a, another plastic eyeliner but anyway as you just saw me use it it's really good i like it, it stays on as well i kind of want to do like a green underneath or something and just disrupt this shit the next thing i failed at is getting married as i said before i started my 20s a uh, pretty strong christian and it was it wasn't like my main goal in life but it was a career a clear part of how i pictured my future because i thought it'd be cool to get that sorted <laughs> So I can get on with the rest of my life and not worry about it. Do you know what I mean? Boys have a massive stress in your teenage years. I understand the pull of wanting to like have that sorted and file it away. And um, I don't know if you've watched any films about marriage, but um, I don't really think that's how that goes down. I don't think finding the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with and then sealing it in means that the case is closed and the job is done and you can get on with other stuff. Um, don't get me wrong, I came pretty bloody close. Um, when I was, I got engaged when I was 22 and I was engaged till I was 24 and we actually had a date for the wedding. Like we had like a piece of paper and like a person booked. And um, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, you'll know I backed out and um, haven't come close since. Again, as I've said before, I'm really happy to like attend other people's weddings if you are a married person. I'm so happy for you. I totally get the pull of it and I really respect your relationship. But I don't respect it any more than all my friends and myself who, who aren't married. It doesn't, I think that nobody knows the internal organs of a relationship apart from the two people that are in it. And there are so many reasons that people don't want to get married. For me, I associate it a lot with religion. And to be honest, without religion, I can't really square the circle. I can't really make it make sense in my head. I know things can make sense on paper, but I think there is something to be said for things making sense to you internally, like, sp I say spiritually, but like, inside it doesn't make sense to me and also not to sound like a massive like tin foil hatter as i did in my last one I'm in danger of doing that again we don't know who the government is going to be in 20 years and this is a, a legal piece of paper that i have to sign that's relevant for the rest of my life unless um the government again lets me get out of that legal contract and you can look into like no fault divorce in the uk uh <laughs> but I don't agree with the terms of service, let's call it, on marriage, unless there is this no-fault divorce thing, which is coming in, I think it's just come in this year, 
But the fact that it took so long to come in and the fact that it wasn't in place before and the fact that it could easily go away with the next government, it's just not a legal contract I'm willing to sign. And also, and also it, it, while I think, you know, getting married as a woman is a complete and an amazing sign of optimism, I am in some ways, as you'll know, a massive pessimist <laughs> as well as an optimist. It's very confusing. Imagine being me. But like, I'm not being funny, but up until the 70s, if you were a married woman, you didn't have the same human rights to your own bank account and your own money as like your partner. And I've watched The Handmaid's Tale where they turn off everyone's credit cards and give it to the guy. It was legal to rape your wife until 1991 in my lifetime. Now I'm not saying that anybody that I may marry in the future <laughs> would rape me, but that's not really the point, is it? While I don't think my neighbors are gonna rob my house, I would like it to be illegal for them to do so. And this is arguably a little bit more serious than possessions, no? Basically, society-wise, governments haven't been behaving long enough for me to get into a contract with them because I, I, that's just how I feel, that's how I feel. It's not, I'm willing to have my mind changed, but <sighs> I feel like marriage is marketed to us as a contract between two people. And, you know, as a straight, person you can tell me the differences and similarities if you have a different experience to that but as a straight woman there is already so many discrepancies between how the government might treat my partner and treat me that I'm not willing to make any more contracts to make that easier for them to do and I do really re really recognize this this societal belief that marriage is a, is a contract between two people but in reality it's a contract between to people and the law and the people that control the law, the government. And what I love, <laughs> love Craig, boyfriend, love him. Um, and you know, I'd be willing to sign, you know, various contracts with him. I am would never, like we are not signing contract with this government. Mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm not interested. <laughs> and I don't, again, I'm not a lawyer. And if you are, please tell me different, but I don't think there are any guarantees in, in a marriage contract um, that completely alleviates the possibility of future governments abusing it. Again, maybe I'm being really paranoid and pessimistic and unromantic, but until the pros <laughs> outweigh the cons, I understand you get some tax breaks as married people, married people tell me in the comments. I, I understand that it is financially profitable for some of you to be in marriages. Um, for me, the pros don't outweigh the cons. And while it's great if you did get married in your 20s, again, congratulations, very exciting. I get a little soppy at weddings. I have a little cry, I think it's beautiful. Um, if you haven't done that in your 20s, for whatever personal or societal reasons you've been hesitant about marriage or you haven't found somebody to marry and settle down with, marrying and settle down, also very different things. To me, this should be as inconsequential as like, oh my God, do you like Marmite? Yes or no? Um, <laughs> it's obviously like passionate to the person and like personal, but also like should be inconsequential to everybody else that you interact with because it's that arbitrary to them. It should be arbitrary to them. The last thing I failed at not mastering before the age of 30 is routines. I don't believe in them. <laughs> I don't think my brain responds well to them, especially in moments of extreme monotony like lockdown. Um, I don't find uh, routines as comforting as self-care Instagram posts um, might imply as universal. Um, and if you haven't found a routine yet and you're approaching 30, I don't think they're for everyone. It's just a theory. I do have a few tick box things that I do every day, but I don't have any prescribed time that I do them. And I think it just completely like depends on your personality type, whether you feel like a routine alleviates your um, stresses and gives you more space in your mind to make decisions or it actually feels like cramped and like there isn't much room to breathe or be intuitive or um, <laughs> be flexible and agile in your day. Um, and I feel the second one. And for a long time, I beat myself up for not being able to keep a routine or fit into a th routine or a thing. And it's one of the reasons I think working in an office I, f I found like just like disproportionately distressing. And I don't really have a reason why I'm incredibly privileged to um, eventually have worked towards a place where I don't have to go into an office but I just looked at the people around me and they didn't seem as annoyed at um, the structure of an office and how distracting and and like it just 
really distressed me for a lot of reasons. Anyway, people who have good routines um, when they're in their 20s and into their 30s um, are coping with things that you have no idea about. And they've learned to cope by having routines and that's cool. But would you hear that your friend was going to therapy, ask the therapist what they had told them to do about their issues and then instead of going to your own therapist <laughs> you just copied and pasted what that therapist told your friend to do and then just did those would you if your friend went to hospital and got prescribed pills would you take the pills because you had similar symptoms to your friend no you go to the source and be like hi here's my specific situation i would like to find a solution for me um so when you see like people online who have these amazing routines, you don't know what they're trying to support and, and the, the way their brain works and, and how it helps them. You don't know that for sure. Uh, but what you do know for sure is your own brain. And if you're having issues with the routines that makes you feel like shit and you actually get more done when you don't have a routine, there's more of us out there than I think people think there are. And I think we're great. And you know, I'm not always perfect. A lot of the time I find myself sitting on the floor, ranting to a piece of technology, about the coming apocalypse of um, marital rights. <laughs> but I'm okay, I get a lot done. The bills get paid, the tax returns get filed. Um, I'm alive, I'm here, we made it. No routines in sight. I also think like there's an obsession of, like if, you, if you're if you getting to the point where you're obsessing over the perfection of your routine rather than the contents of your routine and the things you actually want to and need to get done. The routine is not the god that you need to be serving. That is, it's a false idol, my friends. Anyway, this video is just to say, I think that measuring success or, or like milestones by age is, apart from just being a bit rude, can also be racist, classist, ableist, <laughs> transphobic. I'm only like half exaggerating. All of those, there are lots of factors that go into why you arrive at the place you do in your life at the time that you do. And measuring that by age is just a denial of the reality of being a human. And I think we often fall into the trap of thinking of ourselves as failures without having sat down and decided what is a, a failure and a success in our eyes, on our terms. And we just default to, oh shit, I didn't do that thing. It means I'm behind or I'm a failure. And it's just such a time sucker, it's such an energy sucker. And while it's, you know, you're welcome to fixate or spend a lot of energy thinking about a certain thing, there are just so many cool things to think about. So many mysteries yet to solve. So many Wikipedia dark hard <laughs> deep holes to fall into. There's honestly no need to. I think we can also think that the people that we're, we immediately find ourselves near, like whether that's work or, you know, geography or people you went to school with, that's not like, nobody organized that group of people so they're a perfect cross section of society. They're just like a randomly selected group of people. So to take stats from the people that you know in your life and apply them to you and be like, everybody owns a house but me. Everybody has is on the way to having children but me. Everybody does yoga every day but me. Um, it's just bad maths. <laughs> and it's human nature to equate like what we can see in our, you know, immediate and peripheral vision, not what we'd be able to see from a bird's eye view. Today, I just felt like a failure and I was very distressed. And that was an, an inaccurate assessment of what was going on. And I'd hate to think that you are sitting there in lockdown having the same kind of thought process. Because apart from the fact that it doesn't feel nice to feel that way, more importantly, uh, it's not true. And if there's one thing I hate more than mean self-talk, it's inaccurate self-talk. At least get it right. <laughs> Tell me in the comments the age you are and the things you didn't accomplish that you thought you would by this age so we can all share in the fake facade of failure um, together. This is more of a little pep talk um, portion of a larger series called The 20s Toolkit where I talk about how to get through your 20s in various different ways. Um, so if you'd like to watch that, there's a playlist right here. Sitting on my temples, weighing on my mind. Um, thank you so much for watching and until next time, Frogs Dog out.